it's a great pleasure to be here. And if you want to find out the uh, a full extent of uh, Ben's CV, it's in your materials. But I think it's appropriate that we do a brief introduction, and then I'll get started with questions. Our format will be uh, the first half of our half hour or so. Uh, I will ask Ben some questions that he and I have sort of thought about. And the uh, back half will be up to you. And if you fail in your duties, I'll jump right in and carry on. Uh, ben is the former co-chair of NBC Entertainment and uh, uh, served as the executive producer of the Emmy Award-winning NBC comedy The Office and the Golden Globe-winning comedy Ugly Betty. And he is the co-creator and executive producer of the hit reality show The Biggest Loser, as well as an executive producer and co-creator of the critically acclaimed The Tudors on Showtime. Prior to NBC Universal, Ben in March 2002 launched Reveille, a production and distribution company focusing on exploiting worldwide intellectual property rights through scripted and alternative television formats. So Ben, you've worn many hats in the industry. You've been an agent, which you were when I met you many years ago, an executive, a show creator, a network programmer, and an entrepreneur. One might observe that two common elements uh, uh, among those jobs and hats are television and lawyers, at least to the extent advice that lawyers give uh, to the people that engage in the former. What can you share with us about your interactions with lawyers in their various capacities in the previously mentioned contexts and roles? Well, um, obviously, uh, there, Hollywood is a, a deal-making uh, environment, and no deal gets done without uh, the participation, partnership, and adversarial relationships that lawyers bring to the table. And uh, we, we have, uh, you know, through all those uh, sequences of jobs and uh, creative roles that uh, I've played and the various companies I've played have relied heavily on, on lawyers and uh, within Hollywood, in the entertainment business, those roles are, are very varied and, uh, and absolutely integral to everything we do. Um, in fact, I've had a relationship with uh, an attorney uh, at his own firm, uh, uh, Craig Jacobson, where I who I think you know, and, uh, and you know, he's, he's basically my consigliere and almost uh, quarterback attorney uh, across the very businesses I've been in. He's represented me personally through each of those successive uh, job endeavors, and now he's the uh, general counsel um, to, the, to my new company, Electus, and, uh, and is spearheaded in, in a way the myriad of uh, attorneys and uh, third-party you know, firms that we've worked alongside. And, uh, you know, obviously the deal making uh, at, when I was an agent was an incredibly uh, valuable tool for me because we sat alongside, um, you know, lawyers throughout all of the various enterprises we would be putting together, whether they were representing rights like uh, I, the Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? which I'm sure, um, which I happily uh, and readily went to UC Riverside's uh, left turn courthouse to, uh, to participate in a lawsuit on recently, but was the, uh, the central figure in uh, packaging and bringing that show to America and you know, working across uh, legal franchises around the world in bringing that show to the states and then subsequently having it licensed around the world. So, so lawyers and the legal, uh, profession has uh, been connected to every factor of uh, our business life uh, inside and the firm that I'm like my company not the firm and we we engage uh, constantly and daily uh, around around uh, our partnership with our with our legal part teams uh, this morning we heard a bit about uh, a bit from uh, lawyers who have bridged uh, the alleged gap between the business world, uh, or let's say the legal world, and, and the world of creativity. Uh, what, what, is, what have been your experiences? Uh, have, you, have you found the lawyers that you work with play a, end up playing a creative role, or have you, have you even managed to drag some uh, into the dark side of creativity? Well, you know, 
you know, obviously David Kelly, who was here th this morning, um, came out of the, the, the legal profession and, uh, and then wrote brilliantly uh, about it. You know, uh, we use experts who translate uh, their expertise into the creative medium all the time. Uh, one of the best examples I, I'm, you know, have is not from the legal profession, but is a, a Dr. Neil Baer who was a partner of ours in show running uh, ER with uh, John Wells, but he was brought in originally as a medical consultant and became the chief uh, head writer of that show. Um, and you see it with programs uh, in the legal profession, in the uh, you know police uh, landscape, and obviously in the medical franchise, as, as you see with a show like House, which, has, which was under uh, my studio when I was at NBC Universal, and we had a series of um, people come in having to invent new things for House to uh, to uh, have wrong with him, but still keep him balanced, and that uh, that required the creativity that only flows from truth. Um, and uh, you know, I think that uh, we always talk about you know the grass is greener from a. Uh, from a philosophical landscape, but that most people kind of want to do the other thing. Uh, and a lot of our uh, creative partners also want to be deal makers. <laughs> and, uh, and I think the creativity that is required inside of Hollywood deal making, uh, which you know, is very much left right brain with, with the legal uh, discipline that you need to ensure that the contracts and the transactions uh, can pass through the rhythm of multiple uh, multiple issues and we always like uh, paragraphs in our legal contracts about you know media yet to be determined in the future or you know never before having I'm, I'm not it's, using it's all known uh, whether yeah. now known or hereafter devised yeah exactly you know so you know having people on your side who are thinking about the tablet before it happens, or thinking about what streaming on Netflix means the moment you think you've licensed them your film just for a subscription DVD and suddenly it's in your living room via an Xbox, or thinking about, uh, in the case of The Biggest Loser, a show we created, the way the rights were divided, and how could we participate further as the creator of the show and provider of the show in the subscription web service we created from the show, you know, the network originally looked at the show purely like they look at any show. Oh, we'll entertain people and make them cry, and uh, and in turn uh, get big ratings and sell advertising. Whereas we were looking at the show as, can we create Weight Watchers? Can we create something that exists well beyond uh, the the show? And uh, you know, it's good to have your uh, legal partners. Uh, thinking alongside you or helping you creatively identify, well, did you think about what if we did a cookbook? You know, what if we did uh, things like that, which to me is, is very creative in, in, it, in its thinking. Tell us a bit about uh, the development process, especially in network TV and, if possible, regarding either presentation to you as an executive or perhaps uh, as a creator yourself, um, uh, any law-related programming. I will. Do, do, does anyone mind shutting this door? Sorry. Thank you. Um, you know, the development process is is a long and uh, incredibly um, rich process, littered with the carcasses of failed ideas. And the uh, process, also from a legal standpoint, has a lot of elements that create tremendous exposure for somebody working within it on a day-to-day -day basis because everyone in this room, I'm sure, has created a weight loss show in their minds or thought about you know, a talent show, which is what American Idol, The Voice, America's Got Talent are, and saw them in their fourth grade class uh, you know, graduation. And what is the distinction between having an idea and having an idea that has elements that are unique to that idea that enable that idea to uh, both become a television show or a motion picture or 
uh, or a, a game or whatever the IP develops into. And so that development process is incredibly guarded and, in how it, the genesis uh, arrives. And we have a whole series of protocols at most of the uh, companies that are doing large volumes of business and entertainment around how and who we will engage in hearing those ideas. So we would like to only hear ideas from people represented by known entertainment attorneys or known uh, agencies who are franchised by both the government and the guilds, the Writers Guild, the Screen Actors Guild, the Directors Guild, to represent ideas, uh, which means that a lot of people, it's a really hard industry to get into and to break through. Um, and in turn, we have uh, whole sets of forms in which before you're even allowed to pitch the idea, you've basically given the idea away uh, in, in, your, in your desire to, to uh, get the idea heard. Those forms are called contracts of adhesion for the lawyers in the audience. <laughs> and uh, that's what she said. Um, and uh, <laughs> and uh, th those uh, processes are, are, you know, need to be rigorously uh, maintained because I, I said to David, um, full disclosure, David has actually uh, been advisor to some, some uh, cases that we have uh, uh, been involved with previously. Um, but I go, if 25 different people from 25 different states are suing you about the same idea. They all created the which they show. All, which they all <laughs> created. And the show actually was created in Colombia by a guy named Fernando Gaitan. How how can uh, how can can't they just can't we just submit that to the to the judge? Can't we just say yeah? Don't they nullify each other out? Isn't it like physics somehow? But uh, you know, so that's why you have to rig rigorously uh, manage the process. As all of you know, litigation uh, tends to arrive when success is found. It tends not to happen before success because there's nothing to fight over. So, so it, it's something, there's probably not one single reality show specifically because the barrier to entry from a creative standpoint is the execution in those shows, not necessarily the originality of format. I am sure Robert Louis Stevenson would like to sue Mark Burnett for Survivor. You know, it's, there is a series of those uh, ideas and just as with, uh, thank God, Shakespeare's in the public domain or half of David's uh, scripts would, would be, uh, would be uh, you know, available for judgment. So the development process is one in which from a protection standpoint, the buyers and shepherders of those ideas are rigorously maintaining uh, rights to, to hear ideas without being exposed uh, around the hearing of those ideas. And secondarily, from a development standpoint on the creative level, development is a long process shepherding the idea through to the packaging of that idea from a creative standpoint. So I'll just give it a, an example of a show uh, that I put together called The Office. Uh, and so found uh, the show when I was in the UK in uh, my friend's apartment on vacation in London and saw the, an episode come on the air of the British show created by Ricky Gervais and Stephen Merchant and thought, wow, this is so funny, this is so off kilter, and is it real? And uh, took, took uh, a moment to begin laughing and recognizing the genius of the show and immediately sought out uh, Ricky and Steven, who I was able to get to through um, my friend Sasha Baron Cohen and Dan Mazur, who you may know from the Ali G franchise, among uh, other things, Borat, if that's more to your liking, and, uh, and went uh, and got a meeting with him. And subsequently, uh, he introduced me to his agent, and we began a negotiation for those rights. But that was just phase one. Here's a, here's a show that is, you know, if you're very familiar with television, no, no laugh track, which wasn't existing at the time, single camera as opposed to the multi-camera format we're all more familiar with, like Cosby, Cheers, Lucy, and, uh, and starring a short little chubby guy who, uh, who doesn't exactly look like Ted Danson or Alec Baldwin. So we, we had to embark on getting creative partners who could help create an American realization of that show. First, Greg Daniels, who was one of a number of writing partners we sought out in our first choice, who, who came on board and, and loved 
the concept and was nervous about adapting it, but, but fell in line. And so that was a phase in that development where, where someone else who may, may say, oh, um, I would have liked to create a show set in an office about you know, somebody. It's, you know, it's the process of then adding these elements. Then uh, finding John Krasinski to play Jim, who was a Brown University senior in, in New York, uh, coming in for auditions, wanting to be uh, a, an actor, and put him on tape and thought he could be Jim. Then finding Phyllis, because she was our casting person's assistant, and we realized we wanted people who looked like real people, to finding uh, Rain Wilson, who was emerging and auditioning for the Steve Carell role. And we were fascinated with him and brought him back, and uh, Jenna Fisher, and so on and so on, until finally Carell, who was actually unavailable on another show, uh, was the, our first choice, but unavailable to us. And, we had gone through a number of ideas and just kept returning to him and had to work out an arrangement. And then the rest is now we're post Corel. Last night was our first airing, and we still won the time period because the show has a has a big bench of brilliant performers and writers. And uh, you know that that process is development. Mm -hmm. I have more questions, but Michael, in terms of timing, should we? Uh, uh, if we're going to, yes, that's what I'm going to say. I think we should just ask audience members if you have questions. So we have two mics. We can keep going. No, no questions from the audience. Up, oh, there's one over on the left. It's not a pitch. If you if you just go to the microphone, then we'll, everyone will be able to hear you better. There's someone here. Okay, ma'am, please. Um, hi. I hi. really enjoyed your talk. Mm -hmm. Um, I was curious, and I kind of missed it. Why? Lawyers don't play a role in advising on shows, but except Mr. Kelly, who obviously is a lawyer as well, while you used a lot of examples of doctors consulting. Well, I actually, I don't throw me or out. Or, you, you know, if you know anything uh -huh. about that dynamic. Yeah, I mean, I, I did not green light any legal shows. So, uh, so I am not, um, I, I, I'm more of a, you know, the stuff I'm drawn to um, is not always set within the legal franchise. So in terms of what I have developed, created, or partnered on, um, it's not yet, and, and it actually dovetails to a conversation. I've done a ton of reality shows, and we were talking, uh, David and I, about, and you, you can bring it up if you want, about. The, the law and order? Yeah. Yeah, well, um, I, I, I'd ask Ben that, that um, as successful as the Law and Order franchise uh, has been, uh, the, the so-called mothership, Law and Order, Special Victims Unit, Criminal Intent, there was even a show for a, a season called Trial by Jury, which was uh, which followed the the development of a case, but not the chasing of the of the criminals. But there was um, a reality version of Law and Order that was called Crime and Punishment that ran as a summer series in 2002, 2003, and 2004. So I. I just asked Ben, you know, because he'd been at NBC, he might have heard something in the hallway or from the executive suite. W what about a, a lawyer reality show? And? And they didn't look like Mariska Hargitay <laughs> at, the, uh, at the DA's office. Um, but, you know, part of the franchise is it's, it's you know, there's a lot of work in, in being a lawyer. And we don't always love watching work unless it's of the dirty jobs masturbating a bull variety. You know, so the, 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 uh, the, the reality of, of it is uh, literally not quite as interesting as the scripted creative of it. Now, there are amazing uh, shows, like I wonder if this new show, I don't know how it's done, I've just seen a lot of advertising because I'm an NBA fan, I think it's Franklin and uh, Bash, Franklin and Nash, Franklin and Bash, uh, which is a seems like a high arc, comedic uh, interpretation of of what two you know frat boy lawyers would be like, and I, they should if they want to remain grounded. What I do know from getting expertise and relying, I would never make a legal show without a lawyer's advice. And I would certainly never make a show that wasn't grounded in reality, because I think even if it's wild and crazy and high comedy, 
uh, it needs to have a foundational approach. Uh, with the tutors, I was a history major. We took liberty with history, but Michael Hurst was an Oxford-educated historian, uh, our writer, and he, and he was obsessed with the history of the time, and he went and found maybe things open for interpretation, but it was because he went to first-person uh, materials that actually hadn't yet even had uh, you know, been interpreted via uh, historians over time, but he chose to allow uh, that to push his creativity. But without that knowledge base, as we put together Biggest Loser, I brought in the head of the Tufts Nutrition Department. We brought in the head of physiology out of, uh, you know, Cedar sinai We brought in a leading sports doctor who wrote the, the book Any Given Sunday about the, the Los Angeles Raiders. So I, we're constantly surrounding ourselves uh, with experts in Hollywood, and I would never embark on a, a legal drama or comedy or reality show with, without that expertise. Uh, and so I think there are, are a lot of roles uh, for lawyers to play in that, especially around specific arenas. I would imagine this new show about the coroner's office uh, has a, a number of uh, experts who have come from that world as well. I'm curious. In terms of legal education, what are the qualities and fields of study that would be most valuable to you, a young lawyer coming in? What, what skill set does somebody who wants to work within, with the entertainment creative, what should they know? What would be your ideal? Well, I think it's, we're in this incredibly interesting time, and I think Stanford specifically has such an enormous role to play in, you know, I, we flew up from uh, LA, and it may have only taken an hour to get to Northern California, and all these places were these big campuses filled with Apple and, uh, and uh, others are, are located, but it's like going to another country in terms of the divide that's existing right now between the engineering culture and the creative culture, both of which have elements of each other, but are really, really kind of going behind trench warfare right now from a major corporate uh, approach. And there is such an opportunity from the legal expertise needed to be navigating as these worlds merge. And uh, that, to me, is a skill set that's not forming independently in Hollywood or independently in Silicon Valley, but is required to be happening somewhere over Santa Barbara. Um, and, uh, and that is something that I would welcome either as a multidisciplined approach from, from a uh, legal scholar to, a, um, to literally what are the kind of casework and, uh, and study work and, that you, and coursework you could take or, or begin your career in that could give you expertise in. Because I think we're just about to, we, we're about to go to an accelerating factor here around issues of windows. You know, I sold them to Netflix, but now it's coming in my television to how payments work, to how uh, residuals work, to how the guilds are gonna be navigated in these new, new uh, environments. And then also from a creative standpoint, how we marry for the next forms of storytelling, engineers and writers in the same room to think about it, and then in turn, the, the lawyers who need to be there to help kind of enable that new creative thinking to happen and where it goes. So, so that, to me, is going to be a massive opportunity where there really isn't a built, uh, a built history. So it's also a place, if I'm a young person, you could make a mark quickly because uh, the other people are still very entrenched in their existing uh, workload. Thank you. Michael, do you have a... Um, so I'd like to ask you about something that's going to be the subject of a talk this afternoon. So I'm sort of stealing Lawrence Friedman's thunder a little bit here. Uh, he's going to talk about the Judge Judy genre. Yeah. It's a form of reality show that is phenomenally successful. 
there are, these judge shows are on from nine till five without a break. Judge mm -hmm. Judy being the hot, most highly rated of them yeah. all. Can you explain why these shows are so appealing to so many millions of viewers? Well, they're the ultimate game show, right? I mean, you come in, you got a, you have a, a resolution, you know, especially for the daytime viewer. Uh, they, they had formerly been in the ongoing serialized soap opera business, which has, has kind of gone away, but you couldn't get the takeaway uh, of just watching one or two of them. You kind of had to be committed to know what was going to happen in the cul-de-sac uh, and needed to get a, a background uh, of the previous, you know, six years of episodes to understand why the twins had uh, divided in two and come back to life or whatever was going on. And, and so for me, I think there's an incredible satisfaction in, in the courtroom uh, reality judge shows from you know, I want to sue him, he wronged me, Judy makes a resolution, you know, and I can, I, I know what happened from beginning, middle, end. It's a really good storytelling engine with a resolution that is enormously satisfying from a casual viewer's perspective, which is what most of the daytime audience is because they're typically multitasking or they're um, not able, as they once were, the way time is more of a commodity, to commit to watching their soaps all for five hours a week. They may be now watching two episodes a week of the judge shows, but accumulating. So that, that's my visceral you know, instinct about it. It's why I kind of will tune into those shows the same way that Who Wants to Be a Millionaire is still on in daytime television as well, or that Jeopardy, and you know, it's like there's a winner. And I think that, that, that makes, that's an element of it. I don't know, and I defer to all of you, you know, where, how real those shows are, or, or whether the sense from an audience that it feels real because it's actually a courtroom. Um, so there's an inherent kind of, uh, a inherent authority to those shows that draws people in to, to believe them. Um, they're obviously personality-led as well, you know, so uh, there's no mistake that Judy has an incredible force of personality that, that people uh, respond to, but for me, it's more the mechanism. Why have there been so many derivatives of Judy and why are there 50 of them now? I think it's because they're cheap to produce and very satisfactory from a viewer relationship. Uh, Michael, if I could just add a comment, because I used, there used to be a program at the... Uh, 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 bar, the Los Angeles County Bar, where you could, uh, if you were five years in practice, you could serve as a small claims court judge pro tem, and I signed up for it. So for several years, I was a small claims judge. And uh, my view of, uh, I, I used to say to the people to, uh, before session would begin, that for most people, their contact with the legal system, the average person's contact, their day in court, is going to be in small claims court. And number that first factor. The second factor is they're almost always there for something that they're extremely passionate about, but in the big scheme of things is relatively small. So we'd have people who didn't get paid $75, but they're prepared to take a half a day off, or their car got dented uh, at a restaurant, and the restaurateur or the owner says they won't pay, so they, they go to court. The combination of the fact that the average person can, A, identify with a thing that they might actually do or had done in their lives, go to small claims court, and two, that they tend to be little disputes that they can identify with and understand the passion of the two people in, in front of them. And then finally, as Ben points out, the guiding sort of mediating role that the judge plays, if it's dramatically correct, all feeds into something that the average person can, can enjoy. Uh, and as you and I know, one of our form, well, you want to your former colleagues and my former teachers was in a show that goes back, I think, 50, 60 years, day in court, none other than Judge Edgar A. Jones, Jr., and when I took him for torts, we all, of course, greeted him as day in torts. Um, there were also one, one episode of a soap, five episodes of a judge show, price point. <laughs> How are we doing on time, Michael, because we can carry on, but it's past one t Okay, fine. Uh. Hi. Um, I really liked that insight on uh, Judge Judy. That was, that was really great. Yeah. Um, 
My question is actually going back to the distribution uh, issues that you were talking about earlier, and I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about what happened with Friday Night Lights and whether that situation is completely unique or whether that's a model that has uh, any feasibility outside of that particular show. Yeah, it, it, what um, you're referring to is Friday Night Lights, which was airing on uh, NBC and doing marginal ratings, but was a passionate fan favorite. Um, I w reached out to uh, DirecTV to be a co-funding partner along with General Motors and Applebee's. And if you watch the show, you see an Applebee's and a General Motors dealership. It's not by accident. Um, they, they, uh, and we broke what had been sacrosanct for broadcast television, which was the idea of allowing the premiere episodes to air on a different platform. Uh, there's been a long history, actually Dick Wolf again in those Law and Order series at the center because they're, they're, um, the resolve and the closed-ended nature of those shows allow them to replay so well and repeat so well. And they were the first shows to repurpose on, uh, in the same week. But this was inverting it where DirecTV actually had the premiere episode and uh, NBC took the second episode. Um, and that enabled the show to stay on the air with the same ratings on NBC, uh, but for one third the price that NBC had contributed before. So it was a very valuable model um, and one that was subsequently uh, pursued by Damages, the FX show, uh, which also followed that rhythm with DirecTV. I think it is an issue about uh, which you won't see a scaled amount of these programs happen like that because the MSOs, which is what DirecTV is from a satellite provider perspective, are um, constantly uh, at, at war with each other, but also in a kind of love-hate relationship with the networks that they uh, pay money to carry, like FX. Uh, subsequently, NBC, CBS, and the broadcast networks are now getting this retransmission consent monies as well, and, uh, and the big ones, ESPN, is getting $5 a month from your cable provider for their services and keep launching 3D and ESPNU, et cetera, so they can charge more and more for repurposing the same programming. And, uh, and so there's that constant tension which makes the other MSOs who carried NBC and now pay would f be furious about that happening again. And at the time, NBC didn't get retrans revenue. Today, now that they're part of Comcast, you would never see that deal happen again. Um, I think what's more interesting that's happening is Netflix funding House of Cards, which David Fincher's directing and uh, Kevin Spacey starring in, and actually stole that. Uh, not stole that, but uh, lawyers. No one yeah, stole yeah, anything. Yeah. That's a camera over there. Uh, <laughs> they actually outbid in a competitive marketplace, <laughs> a, a, a rival platform who is also in the same business, potentially, on a not limited, but... Uh, so they, they bid on uh, a original uh, production for the first time. And that's really what's kind of like alighted Netflix as potential friend, potential competition to, to the, these platforms like, like HBO, who then subsequently is doing their own version of Netflix with HBO to go. So I think you're going to see more and more of that. And I'm incredibly hopeful as a Hollywood creative person that companies like Apple and Google and Netflix and Yahoo and Amazon will want to pay for original content so that the people in Hollywood can continue to make original content. And, uh, and that's something that um, a lot of us are betting on uh, happening because we think content is a great differentiator as you launch these uh, services. Okay, Ben, thanks very much. Thank thanks you, David. All. Thanks so much. Thank you, Stanford. Thank you. Thank you, Michael.